Hey everybody, uh, my name is Sam Walker. I'm an engineer at Airsquad. Um, this is a workshop about Keyspace, which is a protocol for end-to-end -end encryption using Ethereum and IPFS. Um, before I get started, I wanted to give a bit of a prologue for putting this piece of technology in kind of a, a larger context of what I see of uh, kind of emerging technologies. Um, so the inspiration for Keyspace first came to me about a year ago when I was listening to a podcast uh, by Arthur Falls called The Third Web. Um, he was interviewing a developer named Dominic Tarr, who's the, um, who develops a uh, distributed social media network called Secure Scuttlebutt, uh, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, but the thing I really liked in the, in the interview was he talked about this concept called cypherspace. So cypherspace is what he sees as kind of an emerging uh, style of application development on the net or on the web that uh, has a kind of a proper abstraction between the networking layer and the application layer and, and that proper abstraction is enabled for the first time really by use of different uh, cryptographic primitives. Um, I think that uh, Having your um, application logic divorced from your um, network networking logic looks kind of like uh, GraphQL in that you know you, you can kind of specify uh, what your application needs, but you don't have to worry about how it gets to you. So I think some more concrete examples of like what cypherspace is and, and how this uh, kind of development methodology is going to play out in the future. Um, it's going to be made clear in some later examples, but uh, just to have that context as you, as you kind of uh, um, watch this presentation. So this is the agenda. Um, we're going to start out on a high level and just answer what is Keyspace, so why was it built, and what are its core components. Uh, then we're going to zoom in a little bit more with an in-depth technical description. Uh, so there's kind of three main stages in the user lifecycle within the protocol. Uh, we're going to work through each of those. Uh, after that is the fun part. Uh, we have an interactive example. So there's kind of a demo app that you all can load up on either your desktop or your phones. And we can kind of do some peer-to-peer -peer, uh, encrypted uh, group messaging amongst each other. Uh, and then at the, after that, we'll have some time for questions or exploration um, to see, you know, uh, what we can do with this kind of protocol. So first, uh, definitions. Uh, what is Keyspace? Uh, I think the simplest way to sum it up is that Keyspace is a trustless, open PGP implementation built on top of Ethereum's existing cryptographic key tooling. So some obvious questions come up from this definition. Uh, first of all, for those unfamiliar with uh, cryptographic protocols, what is OpenPGP? And secondly, why do we need OpenPGP on Ethereum? So PGP stands for Pretty Good Privacy. Uh, it's an encryption program that provides cryptographic privacy and authentication for data communication. Uh, PGP is used for signing, encrypting, and decrypting text, emails, files, directories, and whole disk partitions and to increase the security of email communication. So that's just the definition from Wikipedia. Um, so PGP, a little background, it was developed by a cryptographer named Phil Zimmerman in the 90s. Um, it was first developed as enterprise software. Uh, it was first developed as enterprise software in 1991. Uh, around 97, uh, Phil decided that this would only work if it was open source, so we started the Open PGP initiative. Um, then around 2014 is when uh, elliptic curve cryptography was added to the protocol spec, which is much lighter weight than uh, the uh, older forms of encryption that the protocol used, like RSA. Uh, this kind of lighter footprint allowed it to be more realistically used in the browser, uh, so openpgp.js was added about the same time. Um, kind of. Uh, opening the door for end-to-end -end encryption, screen-to-screen uh, -screen encryption. So you know, there's no, uh, you know, it's it's kind of the the standard of encryption that we like to have today, which is used by like Telegram or Signal and other things like that. So why do we need to bring PGP on Ethereum? So a little background. This came 
to be because of specific uh, kind of business needs that Airswap had. Um, so in kind of the history of like DEX development, um, the first popular DEX is like Ether Delta. Uh, all the information was held on chain, like in the smart contract. So both order posting, order matching, and order settlement all happened on chain. Um, kind of second generation uh, DEXs had some improvements upon this to save gas. So um, protocols like Airswap, uh, 0x, IDEX, uh, DDEX is Hydro Protocol, and DYDX is New Limit Orders, all kind of used uh, a similar approach for gas saving where um, an order is signed off-chain, um, it's uh, posted somewhere, matched off-chain, and then settled on-chain. Um, so on Airswap in particular, uh, the way that uh, the protocol works is that um, order posting happens peer-to-peer, -peer, so makers send orders directly to takers. Uh, matching happens when the taker decides that they want to fill the order, and then the actual settlement happens when the order is filled on-chain. Um, but since all of this is being moved off-chain into messaging, that messaging has to happen somewhere. Um, so a, a, there's a possible information asymmetry that arises, because like for example, if Airswap is hosting the messaging platform, then we kind of have a global view into all the messaging that's happening. That could potentially give us like an unfair advantage of like a you know seeing a trade that's going to happen before it happens, um, or you know in more OTC style interaction, we can see people negotiating a, tra a trade in plain text. So to kind of eliminate this kind of unfair angle or this unfair view, uh, we need encryption. So if all messages between makers and takers are encrypted, then uh, they're the only ones who are able to see it, and there is no kind of global view uh, to exploit uh, from the angle of being a more technical party or um, kind of having a global access to the system. Um, so we need both encryption for that reason, and then we need authentication to uh, basically tie the messages that are created to a particular Ethereum address, um, so that if somebody is being abusive in the messages that they send, for example, trying to DDoS the network, we can say, okay, these messages are cryptographically verifiable as having come from this address. Um, we're going to like disable, you know, that address can't send messages anymore, and then we can kind of see if assets transfer between that address and another address. We can, you know, basically figure out who's uh, abusing the network or, or have some standard where we can have economic incentives for behaving correctly. Um, so, obviously, uh, and by authentication, I just mean a signature and verification of, of uh, messages. Um, so there's a lot of different cryptographic protocols that we could use for authentication and encryption uh, of messaging, but PGP seemed like the right choice for uh, multiple reasons. Um, one of the main ones is that it's the right age. And, and what I mean by that is that it's, it's been around long enough that it's, it's fairly safe. Uh, it is, um, you know, very robust. It's used all over the world. And uh, it's been around long enough that it has great tooling associated with it, which kind of like helps on the developer lift of implementing a protocol like this. Um, but then it's also simultaneously new enough that you know it uses uh, cryptographic algorithms like you know ellipt elliptic curve cryptography, which is like weight enough to use in the browser without negatively impacting the user experience. Okay. So that's kind of like the high level view of uh, why we needed to implement this uh, trustless version of PGP on Ethereum. So we're going to zoom, zoom in a little bit and talk about kind of the specific implementation and um, how, it, how it looks and feels for a user. Um, so the first step in that is a key generation and recovery. So what this means is that we're trying to deterministically generate a PGP key pair from an Ethereum key pair such that we can verify that this Ethereum address generated this PGP key, and that if the PGP key is lost, for whatever reason, we can regenerate it as long as you have control of the wallet. So kind of a practical example of this is if I have my ledger, and I generate my keys on one computer, and I use those keys to read my encrypted messages, I can then terminate that session, wipe out that information, plug my ledger into another computer, regenerate my PGP keys and use them to decrypt the same messages. So it's kind of, uh, it's stateless in a way, it's, and it, it's deterministic, and so that's just kind of one of the properties we wanted to have in the system. Um, the, the next step after keys are generated is a key distribution and lookup. 
So if I want to send a encrypted message to you by knowing your Ethereum address, I have to have some way to you know, look up that Ethereum address and uh, find your PGP key, and, and can, I need to be able to cryptographically verify that that is indeed your PGP key, which I can then use that public key to encrypt a message and send it to you. Um, so there needs to be some sort of directory, basically. The, uh, the initial impl implementation of this actually for us was a smart contract. So you basically stored your PGP key uh, on IPFS, uh, took the IPFS hash of that key and stored it in a smart contract, and then when I wanted to find the key associated with your address, I would just look it up in a smart contract. Um, pretty soon then, we discovered that there is like a whole swath of users who didn't want, who wanted to basically try an application without paying gas up front. Um, you know, as soon as like you have to pay for a transaction, they weren't you know as interested in, in using that application. So um, there's another alternative way of storing these uh, keys, where instead of uh, storing a contract, you sign it so that you can verify it as yours, and then the signature together with the key can just be stored in any database. And since that signature always exists next with it, you can just pull it and look it up. It doesn't have the same guarantee of availability as a smart contract, so currently that database is hosted by Airswap, and you know if Airswap went away, then that database wouldn't be hosted. But for those users, like you know, they would just have to regenerate their keys and they could begin using the system again. So there's kind of different options of like, you know, based on like the longevity, the dependability that you need, um, and uh, uh, you know the level of trustlessness that you desire, you can you know, either pay more for that or kind of have more of a low investment alternative. Um, so the, the third step in this is uh, passive authentication and privacy. Um, so after everything's set up, basically, you know, keys are generated, uh, they're distributed, and they can be looked up, then uh, we can use them at the application level without really having to understand anything about the, uh, you know, the underlying cryptography. So just all messages between peers are, have the simultaneous guarantee of if you receive a message, you know for sure that the Ethereum address that sent you that message um, is who they claim to be. And when you send a message, you know that nobody other than the Ethereum address that you intend to read it will read it. Um, so that's kind of like high level. Um, oops, I got out of order. Um, so zooming in on uh, key generation. Um, so there's actually some, you know, we're not the first people to kind of come up against some of these problems. And uh, a lot of the, many of the cryptographic libraries that wallets like MetaMask, for example, depend on like uh, provide methods of deriving secondary keys from primary keys, but unfortunately, uh, there aren't there isn't an RPC spec for kind of exposing these methods to like the end user on a DAP. But um, so the way that we get around that is uh, key generation um, happens by taking a passphrase, uh, which is just a plain text word um, or, or a set of words and then signing it, and then using that hex string that's generated as kind of the encryption key for, uh, that encrypts your private PGP key, basically. So uh, openpgp.js, when you generate uh, a new key pair, you have the option to pass in a passphrase, that's kind of the encryption password. So that signed message becomes the encryption password for your key pair, basically. So that's kind of a, on a low level how those two are associated. Um, and then uh, once that key is created, IPFS provides kind of cheap, reliable storage. Um, so the way that works for us is that uh, we store the IPFS, um, uh, we store the key pair in IPFS in like basically a, a redundant uh, set of nodes uh, using a pin set. So you know they go from uh, Infura to Pinata to our own IPFS uh, node um, to. Uh, Cloudflare and, and, and some others, so we kind of use that, that pin set to like replicate across all those nodes. Um, so that kind of uh, makes these key pairs uh, reliably available without having to store them like on a smart contract, basically. So key distribution. So this is kind of like the directory or the index that I, I talked about before. Um, I think I actually covered most of this already, but uh, one thing I wanted to touch on was this idea of multiplexing, which is a, an idea that kind of comes from uh, libp2p, basically. So if you, if, there's basically like, um, it's kind of 
like function overriding, but like on the network level. So if I want, for example, to request some information, uh, I shouldn't have to care about how that information is stored um, or how it's fetched. I should just be able to, you know, ask it, ask for it, and have some guarantee about, you know, how it gets to me. So, kind of the multiplexing in this case is that uh, we have keys that can be stored in a smart contract or keys that can be stored in a database. And when you look up, you kind of do that lookup of both the smart contract and the database in parallel. Um, and uh, on the application level, you know, you don't really care about where that key is stored, you can just use it. And uh, this also allows for the addition of uh, other types of data stores for distributing the keys, one of which we, we use in our demo, uh, which is coming up shortly. So auth and privacy. Um, so this is kind of the, the last step in the user lifecycle. So this is like after everything is generated and distributed, um, we can just enjoy the benefits of uh, everything that the open BGP library offers. Um, so on Keyspace, uh, on the Keyspace class, there's four function types that are pretty much everything that they're going to use. Uh, you have an encrypt, which takes a message, a plain text message, and the address that uh, you're going to send that encrypted message to. Um, decrypt, which takes an encrypted message in the from address, so you can verify you know, that it was sent by the address you claim to send it, and um, yeah, then you can just get the decrypted message that's meant for you. Uh, and then we also, in isolation, provide uh, sign and validate as well. Um, so that's all for the high-level overview. Now is the fun part, which is the demo. So this demo will work on both your laptops and phones, as long as they're connected to the internet. Um, so uh, you can go to the, the top link there with a live app is on the airspot.github.io slash keyspace slash deathcon. Uh, sorry, that link is not short here. But um, originally this, uh, this would be um, kind of a lot of cloning repos and, and interactive coding, and kind of I saw like all the network limitations we seem to have here, so I just kind of spun up this app uh, quickly, which I think uh, should work on, I tested on pretty throttled internet, so it should work all right. Um, but uh, I think this kind of will give us a, a view into kind of like the, the inner workings of the protocol without um, uh, having too much of a, a bandwidth limitation. So I'll, I'll let everybody pull it up um, and then I will uh, pull it up on mine and, and kind of walk everybody through how it's working. So um, the it's basically just a it's a React front end application that uses um, IPFS PubSub to kind of uh, have group messaging. So the one of the cool things about this is that there's it's a, a group chat app that doesn't uh, have any central server to it. So basically, everybody's fairing in laptop uh, kind of in the room is kind of uh, going to be networked together and uh, it's going to form a peer-to-peer -peer chat application. Um, oh yeah, and um, also, sorry, I should have mentioned. Um, when you first load the application, um, it has an option to connect with MetaMask, which that'll also work in like a wallet like Trust. Um, and you can also just generate a wallet uh, inside the app, uh, generate a temporary wallet, which will, um, uh, you can still you know, use that to communicate since it doesn't currently use any gas. Um, so do most people that are going to pull it up have it up? Yeah. Anybody still typing? We're good, okay. All right, so I'm going to get to these steps myself. I'll generate a temporary wallet. So I'm the only peer that I found so far. Hopefully over time I'm gonna find all of you. Is are other people at this screen after generating the wallet? Okay. Hey! There's everybody. Okay. So nice. I hope the mobile display still works with all these addresses in it. I wasn't able to test with that many people. Okay, so I'm gonna be Sammy. Okay, so, whoa. 
Okay, so this is everybody sharing uh, their PGP keys with each other. Wow. Okay, I definitely have not tested it with this much scale yet, but it's, uh, it seems like it's working okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I can I can go into a little bit of wow. Uh, I can go into a little little bit of what's going on here. Um, so basically, uh, this uh, on this far tab, I think it says peer on your phone. Um, on the desktop, it says peer discovery protocol. So basically, uh, this is a, instead of using a database um, or a, a contract to distribute uh, keys, um, we all connect to the same IPFS uh, pub sub topic. So there's basically um, one IPFS uh, server that um, we reach out to and say, um, hey, I'm, I'm listening to this topic. Um, then when other um, people connect, they also reach out to that same server and say, I'm listening to this topic. And, we kind of find each other all through that way, and then uh, peer directly with each other. Uh, then after um, we're all peered, we broadcast, uh, we, we broadcast our key, and then we um, send a message, which is what we call a request introduction, which basically is like a, um, we send a message to the pub subtopic that uh, is asking other people for their keys, and then everybody else responds to that person with their keys, basically. So it's kind of like a many-to-many -many messaging system for kind of building this dynamic database of keys. And like, uh, so but as you can see, the more people that uh, are added, uh, the, the more uh, messaging, or the more people are requesting uh, everyone's keys, the more messages that are sent. So that's just gonna go crazy probably right now. Um, so then down here on the new and peer screen, um, Oh yeah, I, I definitely did not design this for this many people to use. Uh, I built this like yesterday. So, uh, um, so you can basically uh, choose the keys um, or the identities that you actually want to send uh, encrypted messages to, and then when you um, let me say hello. Um, and then every sorry to the people that I didn't use them, but just had to be an example. <laughs> um, and so then basically everybody that I selected will get a uh, a copy of that message that they can decrypt. But everybody gets everybody's message. So, but the thing is, is that only the people who I encrypted that message specifically for will be able to um, decrypt it. Um, I'm going to refresh this page because all the people joined have broken my view. Um, so, to take it kind of back to the uh, original um, prologue of the talk and uh, the idea of cypherspace, um, that's kind of uh, what I built this uh, application of, of an example of. So, the actual data transport like layer of this application is completely public and anybody can read it. It just it takes place on a, a public IPFS topic, but there actually is a, a complex application logic of you know permissioned group chat uh, happening in this public forum. So this is kind of the idea of cypherspace that we can kind of divorce application logic from transport network logic and even database storage logic. Like we shouldn't have to care about where the data for this application lives. All we have to care about is availability. That part still hasn't really been solved yet. But, um, uh, and um, then just write our own application logic using you know, these different cryptographic primitives to kind of enforce the rules of our application. Um, so this application, you know, it's, it's totally peer-to-peer. -to -peer. It just exists on all of our phones and our laptops in this room. And um, you know, we're basically sending each other plain text messages, but then uh, all these different cryptographic tools kind of allow us to have a, uh, you know, a structured application uh, built in this really simple context. Um, so, oh, and for those of you on desktop, uh, this couldn't really fit in the mobile view, but you can actually look at uh, the, uh, the key space parameters that I kind of talked through in the, in the first portion. So you have like your unsigned seed, so this is like what you sign to generate your password. Uh, this is the, the Password that you know, basically encrypts your private key, um, 
then this is the PGP public key and the encrypted PGP private key. So these are kind of the, you know, the building blocks that we're, we're using to build this application. Um, trying to think if there's anything else about this one. Uh, oh yeah, um, the nickname. I can't get to it because there's too many people now. But as those of you who have, who have said it, you know, uh, the nickname is just uh, exists as one other type of specialized message on the network, so you can kind of announce your your nickname when you announce your uh, your your key pair. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's it for the. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. I have a, one other thing. Um, so if you have this loaded and you actually want to look at some of the code for the application, um, you can click the question mark in the top right and it'll open up the GitHub. Um, kind of talks a little bit about what it is, um, links to the application, uh, links to the slides in the slideshow, and then uh, links to Keyspace, which is bundled as part of AirSwap.js. Um, you can look at the code for the application, even though I wrote it really fast, so it's not very good. All right, it's, it's messy. But uh, um, I would instead suggest that you actually look at uh, the key space um, in the AirSoft.js library, uh, which actually has uh, some better examples and documentation and uh, is easier to use. Um, so yeah, if you want to include uh, key space in your application, um, this is where you would go to figure out how to do that. Um, yeah, I think that is a, that's it for my demo. Um, I think, yeah, so my epilogue was uh, about putting it in the context of, uh, of cyberspace and, uh, you know, this, this kind of application, right now it's, it's running in public uh, on IPFS, but it could be running on any kind of transport, you know. You, any, like, messaging system, you could have an encrypted messaging system built inside of it. And, uh, you know, the storage can happen anywhere. Um, so. I think that um, uh, the initial um, AirSwap trading network uh, was built on uh, RabbitMQ, and it's easily portable now to IPFS because uh, of like that separation of concerns that we were talking about. So um, I think that, or at least what I believe is that like I think that if we follow kind of this paradigm, I think that like applications that we build in the future that are intrinsically tied to a certain type of web transport layer, like for example, fetching data over HTTP, fetching something from WebSocket, it's gonna start to feel like spaghetti code. It's gonna start to feel like expensive and full of tech debt because it's hard to port. It's hard to, uh, you have all these assumptions in your code about like how the data comes to you, how it's available in the kind of areas that are, uh, will happen when you fetch it. And um, I think that with this kind of approach to building applications, you have a separation of concerns um, such that you can like actually port your application to different types of transports uh, without having um, you know a lot of tech debt that you have to resolve. So yeah, that's uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, I have time for some questions. Um, why did you choose to encrypt the key using a password rather than using the Diffie uh, Hellman elliptic uh, with the elliptic curve that you already have from the Ethereum address? Uh, I think it's because it's not uh, available to DAP users over like a JSON RPC like message. It's not part of like the standard JSON RPC message uh, format for like interacting with a private key, basically. So like. The only like um, cryptographic function that we have available to us as uh, people who build applications that work on top of wallets are basically like you know personal sign uh, uh, send transaction you know there's we don't there's a lot of uh, cryptographic primitives that would be useful like um, when I was first building this and I had a need for encryption I wanted to actually you know I was like well why can't I use the um, you know the Ethereum private key to encrypt data you know yeah or decrypt yeah. data but it's possible, like theoretically, it's possible. Those functions are in the underlying cryptographic libraries that uh, you know a wallet like Ledger or MetaMask uses. But it's just like the the spec for making those functions available, like is you know it's far away. It's going to be a long time until anything like that is. So this is kind of like a a way of uh, working around that limitation. 
do you have to sign the same message every time to get the password? Yeah, so basically, um, kind of what I was talking about earlier, like there's, there's a bunch of different types of users who want to use an application like this. Yeah. Some are more hardcore about like uh, their privacy, and some people want something that's more convenient that they don't have to think about very much. Um, so if you want to, um, for those users who want something that's very convenient and they're not as like worried about privacy, basically you can just kind of sign a you know a default phrase that we choose, you know, and kind of provide to you every time to sign. Um, so then it's kind of like you don't have to remember the passphrase, and you can kind of deterministically regenerate it. Um, if you want another layer of privacy, you know, you can um, uh, choose your own passphrase. It's a secret to you that nobody else knows. But then if you lose that passphrase, then you know you lose access to your messages. So, but that's available for users who want a uh, better uh, layer of privacy. Yeah. Um, can you think of uh, any practical use cases to employ uh, key space? Apart from from the example you just showed. Um. So it's uh, one thing that um, the in, the initial uh, implementation of um, PGP like functions. It uses this concept called the web of trust uh, to function, which is basically like uh, people can trust PGP keys if other keys that they already trust also trust that those PGP keys. So like uh, when, the, when the protocol was first developed, you know, like all the academic nerds would have signing parties and uh, get together and uh, you know trade PGP keys in person, so they could kind of have that base level of trust and build this like kind of trusted network. And then off of that, they like you know built a larger network, and it was kind of like uh, that was how trust was like built like initially, um, like which is kind of actually now cited as kind of a. It's more of a critique uh, of PGP that that's kind of like a, a limitation of the protocol. Um, key space is more um, limited in scope since it's only about instead of binding identities to a real person, you're binding identities to uh, you know an Ethereum address basically. But you don't have to worry about that same kind of web of trust, which has some kind of scalability issues. But I think there are some um, some interesting opportunities uh, with like. Connecting to systems like key, uh, key not key space, uh, key base, um, where like a identity and um, a cryptographic key are already bound by other means. Um, so then it kind of like uh, allows you to use PGP uh, in a more you know more modularly. You know where you can kind of uh, uh, strap it onto other existing uh, networks of trust, basically, as long as they have cryptographic capabilities. Thanks, everybody.